uh, introduction and then we can uh, head uh, to the former session. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our online uh, GCF and LCF researcher and reviewers capacity building seminar 2021. I'm uh, as, as I'm working as a consultant for the HEC on the HEDP project. Uh, this capacity building seminar has been designed to ensure that uh, uh, researchers are able to develop quality um, project proposals in line with. Uh, uh, kindly participants, keep your mics on mute. Um, uh, these uh, capacity building seminars have been designed to ensure that uh, researchers are able to develop quality project proposals in line with the essence of the GCF and LCF grants program. And also reviewers are able to assess uh, research proposals according to the GCF and LCF assessment rubrics. Uh, today we'll be holding a combined session uh, that is session number five and number six due to unforeseen circumstances in the uh, last session, we had to merge it. Uh, today's first session is going to be on designing grand and local challenge projects. Our panel speakers will be talking about how a project design plays an important role in the GCF and LCF grants. The second session will be on teaming up for a grand, a grand and local challenge. Uh, you'll be informed on what an ideal uh, project team for GCF and LCF should look like and how you can uh, find implementation partners for your um, project. Um, before I introduce our panel speakers, I'd like to talk about the agenda for uh, today's online seminar. Uh, we'll have uh, um, four or five speakers for today, and uh, they will each present or talk about their topics for 35 to 45 minutes maximum. At the end of all, all their talks, we will have a combined Q&A session. Um, participants can raise their hands and ask questions, or alternatively, they can type them in the chat box. Yeah. Um, the relevant questions uh, uh, with regards to the session will be read out and answered. Uh, we will be joined today by uh, Umar Ghani. He is our uh, program specialist at the HEDP project and is also the nominated moderator for today as well. Our panel speakers for today are Dr. Sara uh, Jaffrey, who is an associate professor and chairperson, Department of Sociology. Uh, Foreman uh, Christian College. Uh, we also have Dr. Shad Majid, a professor at the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, and uh, Dr. Uh, Heather Bas, head of R&D at the um, Military College of Signals at NAST. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Kashif uh, Kifayat from Air University. And our last speaker uh, will be Dr. Jawad Dar, professor of uh, materials chemistry and uh, head of uh, Clean Material Technology Group, uh, University of London. Uh, he'll be joining us uh, late uh, for the second session around uh, 7 p.m. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand over the session to Dr. Sara Jaffrey to start off our presentation. Uh, Ma'am, the floor is yours. She is muted, I think. Uh, uh, Ms. Sara, kindly start your presentation. Sorry about this. I'm trying to coordinate. Uh, uh, is this Aha speaking or Numan? Uh, Ma'am, Aha. Um... Okay, great. I, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you to Ahad and Omar for coordinating and also thank you to Dr. Ruksana from the FCC side who's um, arranged for some of us faculty members from FC to come and present and support FC, uh, HEC in this initiative. Uh, so I won't take long because there are a lot of speakers and it's already the end of the working day for many of us. But uh, I have a couple of disclaimers. Uh, can you see my slides and is it in PowerPoint mode? Uh -huh. uh, yes, can we can see, see them, but uh, they're not in, uh, now they're in PowerPoint. Great, great. So um, just a couple of disclaimers, and that is that I think one of the reasons for the invitation uh, was not because I received an LCF GCF, but I've received other awards. 
Uh, I've uh, created a summary over here and hopefully um, some of the elements that I'll be talking about because I was due to speak on the session that was canceled yesterday that's mapping your research project. So I can understand why I was asked to speak on this and I hopefully um, the elements that we'll discuss today will be useful for everyone. I was also uh, lucky to attend the session on the 10th. And I noticed um, from the summary of the feedback was that people wanted us to talk less about our projects and more about how we can help them create and finalize their research proposals. So that's how I've um, developed the presentation. But unfortunately, I will be uh, giving my own specific examples and talking about my projects as well, but from a theoretical angle to help you frame your proposals. Uh, and the, the second disclaimer, kind of a disclaimer that I would like to share is that I'm from a sociology background. So you can see that the projects that I've been working on are related to say microfinance and poverty and health alleviation of women borrowers, um, the elderly and intergenerational learning. So intervention-based research to improve um, the aging process for people living in elderly um, in old age residents, public sector. Uh, and two digital literacy uh, interventions for health for women in pr the primary primary sector and for healthcare providers. So, um, so those are the kind of projects that I've uh, completed so far. And I'm going to start off with this uh, wonderful methods map by Gorman and Macintosh. And what it really highlights, and again, this is a question that I heard participants ask in the pre in, in a session in the session on the tenth where do you start and uh, and how do you link your philosophical and theoretical background to what you actually want to do and is it important and the answer is yes it's very important so ideally uh, you know there are two extremes there's actually a positivist uh, philosophical orientation and then the interpretivist and then there's a middle ground which is the mixed methods or the uh, or what we call tri some people call triangulation where we try to merge both the elements and you'll notice in the middle box uh, you can use both quantitative and qualitative methods and this gives you the advantage of being able to merge a lot of data collection techniques so not just stick to closed-ended surveys but also use open-ended surveys and not just design an experiment and intervention but also uh, include focus group discussions with stakeholders and your participants and most of the research projects that i've worked on are all so far the ones that have received a grant have been mixed methods based um, so uh, lastly, I just want to highlight, because again, this was a question that came up, uh, what's hypothesis and what's the, what's a hypothesis and what's the deducted, deductive approach, if everybody can please put their mics on mute. So the deductive approach is re really comes from the positivist and the quantitative background, which is you've through your literature review uh, determined a statement of prediction and then you go out during your data collection process or through it, through your intervention to actually prove whether that was true or disprove the hypothesis and the inductive approach comes from the qualitative background which is to actually go in and try to um, uh, generate theory through your data collection process so you're not generating or testing a hypothesis per se and here again, um, you know, the classical approach is usually to go in either direction, but with mixed methods research or the realist approach, you can go in with both. So you can go in with specific research questions and spe specific hypothesis with that you're testing to prove, but you can also be aiming to generate theory and uh, generate data and find out about the phenomena and the event or the activity or whether um, a certain intervention will work or not um, in, in your region. Uh, in your region per se, because usually what especially, uh, and again, this is a question that somebody was asking, you have international literature usually showing that some public policy intervention has worked or some social policy intervention has worked, but when you deliver it in, in a developing country or in, from the South Asian perspective, you'll see that it doesn't work in the same way. And so that's why we have to sometimes repeat same research processes and interventions in our own countries and our own regional perspective perspectives, because we may just uh, generate different findings altogether. Okay, so before I start off, and because this is a, a presentation on mapping of the research proposal, I really wanted to take some time, uh, just a couple of minutes to uh, summarize findings from scholars. And these are two different studies. One of them is a literature review by Kikula and uh, Wisdom and colleagues. And they've basically done us a great favor by summarizing the reasons why research proposals are uh, rejected. So I'm not gonna read all of them, 
um, and you can, uh, I, I hope that this presentation and its supplementary reading material, the post session reading material is all shared with you. Otherwise, please do email me and I'll be happy to share them with you. But you'll notice that the reason, common reasons for some really good uh, research proposals getting rejected is actually they don't fall under the priority area. So our job or goal number one is actually to read the grant character features and the requirements and the eligibility criteria very clearly. And then also with regards to the write-up, the title, literature review, the overall proposal, it has to be satisfactorily written. There has to be focus. It shouldn't be too broad. And I like these last two points. The references shouldn't be out of date. Uh, a place that I... Uh, something that I usually follow by rule of thumb is to use at least um, have the majority references to be from the last five years, because otherwise you're basically basing your research questions and your hypothesis and your objectives on old data uh, that doesn't have any relevant that might not have um, particular relevancy. Another very important point is not to misrepresent cases. So not to, and one uh, example of this is not to have a, a, a lopsided literature review presented, which has, which would be biased, and but rather to spend time, considerable time having a comprehensive literature review so that you know that you haven't missed any gap or you're claiming to cover a gap that actually has been filled up by pre previous research or scholarship or an intervention. Okay, um, another uh, uh, problematic area is with your the write up of the research questions, the hypothesis and the problem statements and I'll add aims of the research over here again, issues of badly written lack of clarity and focus and not actually possible in reality. So one example of this is that you're attempting to prove something um, uh, in the field or in the community, but uh, the proposal suggests or the methodological write up or the sampling and we'll discuss some of this later on uh, and the Method, methodology or the data collection plan is weak. And so it does, to the reviewers, it seems as if you're not going to be actually be able to do it because you haven't either planned well enough or it's not possible maybe to access that, that area or things like that. Uh, a couple of other things, uh, this, uh, again, I won't uh, dwell on the methods and research instruments, but because I've, I'm going to be talking about these uh, in the rest of the presentation, but it's very important to have uh, attach your instruments and your uh, detailed methodological plan is probably the most important part of your research proposal. And uh, there were some uh, issues uh, in these summaries where, you know, the methods was not reported comprehensively at all or no instruments were attached. Um, the strength and, and just to, to summarize the last few points no strength of pis or collaborators or none mentioned uh, the budget is not complete or justified timelines aren't clear and the plans for dissemination are either not included or not comprehensive so um what i'll start off with is this wonderful uh, timeline by koppelman and holloway and you'll see that there's a zero over here and the minus signs just tell you that the zero point is your when you start writing your research proposal and what many of us forget is that before this period, and I call this the pre-draft or the pre-writing of your research proposal phase, this is where you have to be very careful to think very carefully. Maybe as a PI, you will be doing this on a solitary basis, or maybe you will have some very good team members um, uh, on board very early on who will be uh, troubleshooting with you. But these are the questions that you have to ask. What are the long-term long goals, goals of your project? About impact, we'll talk about that on another slide. But what's your plan? What are the deadlines of uh, what are the kinds of grant areas that you're looking for? Um, do you have some hypothesis that you're actually thinking of before you actually go into the literature review to finalize them further? And some these blue bubbles are things that I've picked up uh, picked up along the way. Do I have the particular writing skills? So usually the, when you're writing a grant for the first time, you your academic writing skills are very strong. Your thesis and dissertation writing skills are very strong, but your grant writing skills aren't that so strong. So here again, reading samples is very helpful. Does my team have the necessary skills? Do we need extra training? Uh, I can't see this part. Should I be the co-PI first? Should I ask somebody else to be a PI? Do I need sectoral collaborators from the public sector, from the industry, which would strengthen my proposal? Um, do I need senior consultants and mentors? And, do I, and, def, and these are not questions to be asked while you're writing your research proposal or after you've started writing, but before. So that's really important important. Another amazing checklist by Davy, which I use while writing my research proposal. Now this is zero plus onwards timeline. 
um, and you can use, there are a couple of other checklists, you can happily use those as well. But what's important is to keep revisiting this uh, each time you write a subsection of your research proposal. And it guides you along important areas like your the scientific potential, research plans, justification of resources. And again, I won't read this item wise, but again, I've attached this to the post session reading material um, and you can access it. It's open, it's openly available, freely available on, uh, on the website as well um, on, on Google. So now just um, brief ideas about what we're going to be talking about and discussing in the rest of this presentation. You can see that this is what a brief research proposal outline looks like. And, um, and uh, you may have more, but these are the minimum requirements. And this is an excellent checklist uh, that is usually commonly available. And these are the things that you should be thinking about. Again, I would say while you're doing your literature review and while you're reading samples of research proposals. And I think um, a good news uh, for us over here and people in Pakistan have started doing this. I've recently published two protocol papers is that when people uh, put in a lot of effort for their research proposal write up, they feel that, well, we'll have to pull out chunks of this information and put it into our final policy report or our final publications. But the good news is that your research proposal can also be published now. And a lot of scholars have started doing this in Pakistan. You can see the two that I've published. But what's really important is to define your impact. And uh, there are a couple of impacts I've mentioned over here, cultural, economic, environment, social, health and well-being, policy influence, legal impact, technological impact. But what's important to remember is that many of, uh, I mean, you know, one research project may have multiple impacts. And once you're culture your impacts and this is like the process of going backwards to forwards once you decide once you've defined the impact that your research project will have it'll be much easier for you to uh, you know write your whole proposal but then also prepare it prepare that proposal for publication the minute you've got, received your grant so um, I'll give you one example, uh, my microfinance health project, uh, which uh, assessed the relationship between women loan borrowers, uh, um, poor women loan borrowers and their health, the health challenges that they faced, obviously did not was not just about impact on health and well-being. It was also uh, a research that impacted the social area of um, women's lives, especially women of reproductive years, women from disadvantaged backgrounds, women who were being asked to return loans, but they didn't have the requisite educational background, so they needed a lot of support in terms of skill and development, etc. And then uh, on another level, there was an economic impact related, because if you empower women with better health and they start repaying their loans and they build better small businesses, then that's going to have an impact, an economic impact on your society as well. So this is uh, really something that you have to think about carefully, again, with your team, outline it, uh, include it in your proposal, and this will help you write your, uh, uh, publish your protocol papers. And you'll notice in these blue boxes, it's the impact that is highlighted next to the abstract during the publication. So you have to be very clear about this right from the start. Okay, another, no, now we're tying up from the beginning uh, and uh, answering the question, is your theory important? And does it really actually help you in the operationalization phase? And the answer was yes, we already decided that. But I'm giving you an example again with regards to the microfinance project that I worked on. I used the uh, uh, framework by Phillips and colleagues, uh, the framework or the theoretical framework for assessing behavioral healthcare. And you'll notice that it ties and you know, when we're doing research, what happens is that it's very difficult to start cleaning your data and your various and which items you'll be covering and assessing and measuring in the field and what you won't be able to. And this is where theory really helps you to zoom in and focus on what is practical and realistic in the timelines that you have decided. So in the next three years, I would be able to cover these variables, but not these. And that this is where the theory really helped me. So you'll notice that this theory by Phillips uh, is, and colleagues is uh, uh, highlighting that there are two aspects, environment versus healthcare delivery system, which impact the micro finance health provide microfinance provider health services and those were two service branches uh, raising health awareness and also providing health insurance to improve health uh, sat, uh, health uh, health outcomes of women borrowers uh, and then obviously there were elements under environment related to housing and um, uh, environment and economic opportunities and poverty alleviation schemes by the government. And then under the healthcare delivery system model, there were many elements related to access and quality and equity uh, by the public sector versus the private sector. 
Okay, so um, moving on the problem statement, this is probably the most important thing that you will be generating from your literature review. And a lot of people tend to skip this. You'll notice in the summary that we were uh, reviewing about the reasons for rejection of proposals, and that's because there's no proper problem statement. And so over here, it, a very good idea is to use recent literature to reference your uh, problem statements. And if recent literature is not backing up this claim that a problem exists in your society or in the South Asian region or in certain Pakistan rural commun communities, then basically it means your research is, uh, is not realistic and it's not practical, it's, it's not focused uh, or it's outdated. You're, you're uh, attempting to aim for something that uh, has either already been done or the problem doesn't exist. So I want <laughs> Yeah, could you please? Uh, so uh, you'll put us a board. Ahmed, could you please ask? Uh, kindly mute yourself, sir, or I'll have to take it out of the. Okay, thank you. So you'll notice over here that, I mean, we couldn't put too much detail in these slides, but you'll notice that these problem statements are actually linking with the sectors. So poverty and debt cycle is linking to your the microfinance sector, but also your economic sector in Pakistan. The challenges related to physical and men mental health uh, problems faced by women borrowers is obviously linking to your health sector and your primary health care services, particularly. Your absence, uh, your uh, and uh, the similar for the third bullet point, and the commercialization of microfinance services is again linking to the the sectors involved over here and stakeholders like even the Security Exchange Commission and the State Bank of Pakistan and state regulators of the microfinance industry. So the this is really important. Um, I'm now going to try to link um, my research questions with the operational tools and with the impact. This gray column you can ignore for now because this is not part of our research proposal, but this is the good news. This is something that we're looking forward to, the actual publication that uh, is generated from our hard work. Uh, and you'll notice that, and I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but let's see the couple of research questions that was generated uh, from the literature review. And these are these help to build my hypothesis. Uh, what is the prevalence of chronic disease bur burden in women borrowers of my microfinance? So that's a research question for this study. And what I did is that I decided to use a quantitative tool for this. It was a, a standardized tool to measure multimorbidity in, um, uh, in South Asia. It was used by Indian scholars. There was some modification and I included some elements, uh, especially by, uh, through uh, consulting meetings with uh, consultation with lady health workers working in the primary sector. And, uh, and, the for, and the fourth question was, there, is there a relationship between the chronic disease burden and mental health challenges? So one of the modifications that I had to include in that multimorbidity survey was that I had to supplement, with, supplement it with a survey that was measuring mental health. So here you go. Uh, this is a very good idea to highlight to your reviewers that you've thought very carefully, not just about the research questions, but which tools you will be using, whether they're qualitative interviews, quantitative surveys, participant observation and FGDs or um, anything else, and what kind of an impact uh, that will have, and then plans for dissemination. So obviously, instead of actually having the publication, you would write, I would be producing a pub policy brief, or I would be approaching an academic journal article uh, for publication, or I would be having workshops and training sessions with stakeholders, I would be having meetings with uh, to share my findings with the government sector, etc. Et now, a little bit more about tools and uh, the kinds of items and subdomains you have to be very careful about reviewers would be uh, would would need to see that you uh, your operationalization very clearly so i'm going to talk about my uh, old age uh, project uh, old age homes project to promote intergenerational learning and activity and engagement for elderly residents and i used uh, four different kinds of tools we used uh, a quantitative survey to collect baseline data we used again a quantitative survey to collect a uh, pre and post test survey and i used um, you know an in, uh, an intervention module with participant observation tools and focus group discussions uh, and the subdomains so the items were standardized tools or regional modifications and including additions from uh, a pilot test and the
these were the domains. So you can see that I've used the who call survey, the WHO quality of life survey, which has four different domains and measures physical health, psychological health, social relationships, and the environment. But then I've also in blue added all the th elements in this box, added all the elements that I had to include myself. So from a, a, a regional perspective for Pakistan, we wanted to include items that measure the satisfaction at old age home, given the type of old age home environment that we were dealing with or delivering the intervention at, satisfaction with the learning opportunities that's specific to the intergenerational activities that we developed that were over here. You can see that we had 10 different modules uh, like oral narrations of the past, uh, use of language and meanings, creative writing, rules for character building, etc. And then uh, we focused very carefully on explaining to the reviewers about the re reliability testing of these instruments. I would we use factor analysis, would we use pilot tests, what kind of training, and then we also attach the training modules for the data collectors and the intervention facilitators in the review proposal, we even publish them in the protocol paper. And I think that really improved our chances for, for getting the grant and also for publishing a protocol paper. So all of this has to be carefully uh, aligned and matching and thought about very carefully. Um, uh, I'm just going to talk about the participant observation tool. This was something that we uh, developed ourselves, our team are really proud of this. It's been published so you can access it. I'm hoping that other scholars will use it. We were able to use a uh, develop a checklist that measured positive emotions and negative emotions so that while the intervention, so that we were not basing intervention results just on the pre and post test uh, perception based surveys, quantitative evidence, but also on qualitative evidence and this data uh, observation data was actually collected by clinical psychologists and their trained team members. So they were very uh, cognizant of different elements and what different times to uh, measure the uh, uh, responses, etc. Okay, now these are specific examples. Again, in the post-session material, I've attached these actual instruments, but just, just to show you, uh, the cover letter is very important. Any permission, other permission letters that you will be sending to sectoral, uh, to gatekeepers and different industries where you're hoping to access for data collection, those should be attached. The actual instrument, uh, you can only see the first page over here, but this is a long page. Again, it's been published, and uh, and so you, could, you should be able to access it online, or again, it's in the post-session reading material. Uh, these di different section headings will are not just attached in the instrument, but you will be talking about them in your methodological write-up i.e. under the subsection of instrument. And uh, the, uh, so you'll be sharing details like how many questions there are, which uh, standardized survey they've been taken from, what kind of a liquid scale exists, and uh, etc. Uh, the inter this is the intervention checklist that I was talking to you, the, the intervention guide that I was talking to you about. These were the guides that were developed for the intervention facilitators and also the supervisors. Those were the principal investigators themselves. And this really helped in creating prompts and generating uh, a very amiable environment for the elderly without any obstruction. And what we did is after every intervention on a weekly basis, we had sessions with the data collectors and intervention facilitators to troubleshoot any problems and possibly even modify the session and the intervention, which is very important. We call this fidelity tests, uh, supervising the intervention facilitators, but also having uh, meetings with them during the intervention. <laughs> instead of planning an intervention for say two years or three years and just letting it go based on the initial plan, it's very important to either have quarterly or even weekly uh, sessions to uh, and uh, modify your intervention based on the needs because you usually when you're dealing with human beings modification is important okay this is the participant is an example of the participant observation tool that we uh, developed again attaching this material to your research proposal just tells your reviewer how serious and how well thought out you uh, it is and it also helps before you know, that when you receive that grant and you start working, uh, that lag that usually uh, people talk about happens because you don't have these append uh, this supplementary material or those instruments ready. So having them ready at the proposal stage may delay that, for example, you haven't applied for the LCF, but you'll apply next year, but it, it's worth the delay, I would say. Uh, here's uh, just an example of the kind of sectoral collaborators or an organogram that you should communicate to your uh, reviewers. Um, it doesn't matter who's there and who's not there, really depends on the project and what kind of partners you would need. Um, and this is just an example of the partners that I had for the digital health literacy intervention. 
the sectoral collaborators and then the senior consultants and all the different co-PIs that actually manage and supervise each of these elements. But this is not enough. I would say that with the organogram, what's important is to actually have a detailed task list. So you can see over here that for the primary uh, healthcare, uh, uh, for the digital health literacy intervention for poor women borrowers in disadvantaged communities, I'm just going to talk about one, one of them. One of our co-PIs, Anna Muzammal, who was in charge of the intervention literacy development, her specific deliver, uh, tasks were the preparation of the content material. So this was communicated in the research proposal that she would be responsible for this. And supervision of the media team, preparation of the content for intervention training, uh, specifically for hygiene and sanitation, and then coordination with experts to get the literacy, literacy material approved. And then these were her deliverables. So over here, uh, communicating to the uh, reviewers that this is a software that you will use for the project management is great. But also having the actual items that you will include in that project management for the deliverers and task mon and monitoring is very important. So we know exactly which co-PI is assigned which duty. They are also prepared to work on the project. And this also helps in uh, guaranteeing them uh, a budget allocation or a stipend for their services and their time for the project. Okay, uh, what's also important over here, and uh, I'll take you, uh, just remind you that this was mentioned in one of the review, in the reviews for a rejection uh, of a research proposal is not actually uh, defining a sample. So uh, under the sample subsection, what's important also to mention is the selection criteria. A detailed selection or a specific selection criteria of who you will be sampling. Uh, you can see over here that I mentioned for the microfinance project that I would be defining poverty level, let's say under 3.5 US dollars. And then I would only sample women who are earning below that. Uh, I would also sample only women who are earning below PKR 15,000. Uh, per month, and those who are living, uh, who, sorry, who are taking a loan smaller than PKR 15,000 per, and this is per, an, uh, this is annual, I'm sorry about that, those who are living in disadvantaged and rural communities, and those who are currently enrolled in a microfinance loan program. Uh, you can use any formula, as long as you declare it, and you give the justification for it, and I usually use the Yamanis formula, because I usually am stuck with a smaller grant, and I can usually sample only less than 400, uh, but, but having said that i've been sampling about up to thousand people but again it's not important which cal uh, calculation uh, or sample or formula you're using but that you justify it you mention it you talk about it and don't skip this section altogether uh, then again the detailed uh, data collection plan and your data collection team so for example for a particular project and we'll be talking about this in another session related to ethics would you be taking women data collectors and intervention facilitators would you be taking men what's the reason how many would they be would there be a supervisor who would be supervising the supervisors what kind of a training and a monitoring checklist will be there and I've, I had also, I usually attach the monitoring checklist as well uh, as part of an appendix to my research proposal. Uh, a detailed break, breakdown of the sampling areas province wise, and again, the justification. So, for example, I've written. <laughs> So I had a population weightage, uh, which I used to then justify how much I would sample from each province. So this was this is pretty important as well. A map would be great if you can add it. Uh, a final points, limitations and future research target. We usually don't talk about this and or discuss or write about it in our research proposal, but it's important to think about it because every research proposal, no matter how great it is and no matter how comprehensive, will have its limitations. Uh, so I won't talk about the specific limitations I talk talked about in my recent project, but uh, just this is just to give you an idea that this should be thought about and this should be uh, communicated to the reviewers as well. Uh, we're not going to be talking about ethics in this session because we're, we'll be covering it on the 21st, hopefully. Uh, this is an, a budget, uh, a recent budget communicated by H HEC through the NRPU, and it has some wonderful and it's openly accessible. So I would recommend that if every, everybody could download it and take a look or, or download the GCF template. And uh, these headings 
are very good uh, to uh, use and discuss with your team again in that pre-session, you know, the minus session before you actually start writing your research proposals, the personnel cost, the equipment cost, the IT cost, the service providers, and also start get gathering receipts from vendors so that, and you can actually attach those as well. So if you say, for example, have a project on education and you claim to, you want to buy a, a books, then get, then attach those receipts so that uh, it helps the reviewers understand that you're not just claiming something that is unreasonable. Okay, um, a Gantt chart or, and a timeline uh, for the actual project should be part of your research proposal. This is something that I've done quarterly, but you're welcome to do it monthly as well. Some people do it weekly, which is excellent. Uh, clear plans for dissemination is actually the last slide. It could be workshops and seminars, participation in national conferences. You may want to budget some of this. Some of some people have started budgeting for or requesting budgets for open access journal fees, uh, etc. So this should be part of your proposal as well. These are my references, and thank you so much. That's my email address if you would like me to email anything related to this. And I hope I'm well in time. Ahad, over to you. Um, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation, um, for your detailed presentations. I'm sure our participants would uh, gain a lot from this. Um, uh, the, um, the videos are being recorded and they'll be uploaded on the HAC webpage in due time. So in case uh, um, if uh, anyone has missed our previous videos, um, they can uh, go through them on the website. Uh, now I'd like to uh, invite our second speaker, uh, Dr. Shahid Majid, if he can uh, start his uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Shahid, over to you, Ji. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Naman. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, please. So, yeah. Uh, wait. Uh, can you share, see my slides? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, thanks a lot for providing me this opportunity. So let's uh, uh, discuss the today's topic that is uh, very much uh, related to the previous talk uh, that was uh, from the Dr. Saira. So today I will talk about the assessing multiple project plans for the reviewers, what the reviewers think about you. So, and then uh, my name is Dr. Shahid Naji. So I belong to the Department of Entomology, University of Agriculture, Tessabar. So, Let's move forward. Like uh, uh, my talk will have uh, around about three uh, major uh, categories. Like the first one will be the project planning, and then second will be the evaluation, and then the third it will go with my own project. So, so uh, let, let's see. So before uh, going into detail, like the project planning. So these are the some fill, filling the blanks that if we will fill up this one, like. Uh, then we can easily assess it what what we are thinking what we can do it like when you can when you can fail to plan so actually you are planning to fail so this, this is very key uh, of success regarding when you are uh, going to plan your project so it means the planning is the key role uh, key key uh, stuff uh, while while doing the doing or uh, this writing uh, plan or doing any other activities so there are multiple uh, key elements so whenever we are planning any project, uh, particular project, so like the stakeholders needs, like what the funders need. So what's their main uh, thematic areas in which sections they are thinking like uh, we, we want to receive this particular grants as mentioned uh, earlier uh, by Sara. So uh, like uh, in GCF and LCF, we do have some kind of like uh, agriculture section and then some kind of uh, energy water waste and then so on there are major categories and then there is again uh, some kind of subcategory so we have to think about in which section we can fall so uh, this, this is very important uh, uh, point like uh, in case of like uh, this uh, like if i put some uh, question like the reasons of uh, decline of agriculture in pakistan and then its impact on the gdp so this is the bold uh, question and then it's a big goal 
So by keeping this one, keeping it in our minds, we have to narrow down our objectives, right? Like in which section or what kind of reasons can be happened while while doing this uh, uh, to answer this particular question. So by having these objectives, so like uh, uh, those reasons could be like the climate change, it could be the impact of any uh, non-available of uh, resources, or it could be due to the uh, any kind of infestation of uh, any vertebrates or invertebrates, and then some kind of uh, nature disasters, it could have can happen. So by keeping in this, uh, this in your mind, so we have to think about to define our objectives, like you have to think about in which uh, category you fall. So, and then you have to link that uh, particular major goal with, with your uh, expertise, and then you have to narrow down with the deliverables and then due dates. Like deliverables, always it will come up with the three or four uh, subcategories, like uh, that mainly uh, build up the milestones. So like the inputs, like what kind of activities you can do, like the outputs, like uh, what kind of material or what kind of uh, things you can do to, to, to get any kind of outcomes, like uh, uh, outcome is all, all your main goal. So, and then afterwards there is an impact, either uh, their particular objectives has any kind of impact on the society or what you are gaining. So you have to be very defined and precise about these deliverables. So uh, in, the, in the later slides, I will give you the example about it, about the inputs, outputs, and then the outcomes. And then the fourth point is the May project schedule. So you have to schedule about it, like when you have to do it and who will do it, and then uh, how you will do it. So this, this is very important uh, whenever you are scheduling this one. And then afterwards, there is a, some uh, major point that's the roles and responsibilities. So as mentioned earlier in the previous slides, like uh, uh, you must know either you need the OPIs or not. So this, this is completely linked with this one, like the roles and responsibilities. Whenever you, you define your objectives, you define your objectives. So you must know that which particular activity uh, will be linked to which particular uh, uh, PI, co-PI, or your uh, collaborators that will be the academic or that can be your uh, uh, sectoral collaborators. So you have to be uh, uh, really linked this this particular, uh, 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 your questions. Otherwise, it will be very difficult because PI cannot do everything. So whenever you will have a co-PI or the collaborators, you have to be very, carefully define their goals. So, and then later one, uh, the important key factor is the project budget. So I think so tomorrow or day after tomorrow, you uh, there is another uh, particular presentation on this particular budget section, but I will briefly go in detail uh, about the budget. Like uh, always in all type of uh, grant writing, you have the direct cost and then the indirect cost. The direct cost is always linked with the PI that contains the three major uh, parameters like the HR cost and your equipment and consumables. The third one is the traveling. And then the inbred cost is uh, uh, totally linked with the, with the university. So you will get in detail about in the, the coming presentations by tomorrow. So, but I, will, I would like to say here, you have to, whenever you are defining, designing your project budget, you have to be very specific, specific in the form of, uh, you are doing this GCF or LCF, like your equipment and consumable cost must be within a 30% of your direct cost. You have to be very careful uh, because uh, we, uh, if, if the, there, is a, there is some kind of return, like you can get the 100 millions uh, uh, from this project. So that does not mean like uh, you you can buy everything. So you have to be very specific like what you need it. So it means there is a limit like 30% budget. So the more detail you are getting, I think so tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So next one is the communication plans. So like whatever you will have it. So how you can disseminate, like uh, how you can communicate and then how, can, how you can deliver that particular uh, uh, product or your outcomes uh, to the society, like it could be the layman, it could be any uh, uh, any industry, or how it can reach to the, uh, and then it could be usable for the others. And then the last one is the tracking and management tools. That is that is 
that you can do it while having this uh, uh, this project. Uh, you can use different type of softwares like uh, Bitrix or the Asana and then so on by tracking all the activities either uh, everyone is going according to their timeline or time plan and then according to their activities and then uh, as per the activities. So this is uh, just like the overview about like normally here in the watermelon, you will see the green section. Whenever you are getting, we see this green, so we feel it's a success uh, story. But at the end, what the consumers think, they are not happy if the watermelon is not uh, sweet enough. So it means you have to be very careful whenever you are defining your goals. And then you have to be very careful at the end end product. Either it's it's uh, uh, it's uh, a reliable or it's a uh, it's a uh, it, it will be workable or not. So by having this one, by linking this one, I will say you have to be very smart or uh, while thinking, planning, and then implementing your particular project. So smart in the form of like you have to be very specific, like, uh, uh, like your goals must be clear and then it must be the measurable. And uh, and you have to be very clear about like it's attainable or not. So at the end, either it's relevant with your expertise or not. This is very important. Afterwards, at the last one, I will say that it, it's, it must link with your time bound. Like uh, you have to define your time uh, like within within one month, three months, one a year, you, you have to done this particular specific goal. So you, it means you have to be very smart, very specific about your uh, while designing your particular projects. So let's uh, uh, like uh, project writing, whenever you, we are doing this one, like it's, a, it's always a continuous project. So we, ha we always have to uh, re uh, redo and rethink about it. Uh, that's why we are, we always think that like, uh, we always say that like uh, uh, we have to uh, perform all the activities well before time. So while when we are talking about the planning, so the important thing as, a, as we uh, discussed earlier, like the, we have to be very clear, for, uh, clear about your budget, what resources you have, and then what resources you are acquired from the uh, funding agencies. Next, the plan activities, like what you are doing, when, where you are performing these activities and who will uh, doing this one, like that define the goal of role of and responsibilities. And then why we are doing this one, this is important. So th this always we forget it, why we are doing this one. So how you will do the uh, monetary and then ultimately there is a, some kind of risk assessment. But whenever there is a, we are, we are trying to uh, perform any kind of project or there must be a, some kind of risk assessment test uh, well before uh, uh, otherwise, uh, sometimes the things happen. Like a uh, very big example, the last one and a half year, we have a natural disaster about the COVID. So no one think about it. We always shift about this uh, uh, computerized system and then we, we always link in this way. So we, you have to be think about what, what type of goals you have it and then how you will make it. And then uh, second one is the implementation. Like, uh, like the, when you are ready to initiate your project, and then uh, you must know that what type of technical and financial activities you are doing because the PA is the responsible about all these activities, sorry. So, and then uh, in, in the implementation, the most important point is like the follow-up meetings with the collaborators. Like in my ongoing project, like uh, we, uh, we try our best to have uh, once a week meeting about uh, within our uh, this collaboration uh, group. Uh, if, if we are unable to do that, that, at least twice a month, we must have it. So we add, by having this one, so we, we always catch up like what the things we already decided and how all these things are progressing. So we have, and then in this way, we, are, we can help each other also. We can uh, scroll down the stuff, why, why these things can, uh, is not happening. And then is the evaluation, like the progress measurement as per the activities. In this GCF and LCF project, we have the important thing is the implementation plan. That means uh, that is linked with your can chart and then activity plan. Like whatever you have to do it, you must write it and you must know that you are doing this one. You have to follow the, your implementation plan 
while, while doing this particular activity. So, and then the information gathering that can be happened by having your, uh, uh, to, uh, your meetings uh, with your collaborators and then the strong and weak points you have to highlight and then make the decisions what we can do it right now. Like uh, uh, if, if uh, I had this experience last year, like uh, we were running on project and then we were expecting to have uh, the equipment from somewhere uh, outside Pakistan, but unfortunately we could not get it uh, due to this uh, lockdown activities and then uh, some import uh, activity, uh, uh, import due to issues. So we can't do it, we can't make it. So we have to be very careful about it. So you uh, to, then you have to make the decision how you, in the A plan and then the B plan, how you can make it. Again, while planning, I will fall this one into the scope of the your project. And then that is ultimately linked with the implementation, the time and cost. When you spend this one time and cost, ultimately you are getting the quality that, that is always linked and based on your evaluation. Whenever uh, in, the, in the second part, we will discuss about the evaluation, how we will do that and what we can do. So uh, let, let's see, uh, here's a, uh, one example about your implementation plan, like uh, in the input activities, output outcomes and impact, how does it can look like? Like for example, there is a one example, I put it like the management of environmental pollution in, in XYZ area somewhere. So what kind of activities you can do it like you can you can develop the filters for the vehicles or you can do the plantation or you can uh, uh, do some awareness uh, seminars uh, this this these activities always dependent and linked with your expertise so what output is what type of material you can use it what kind of uh, things you can uh, do to get the results of this particular activity like what type of material or source of this plant nursery or the survey and then the uh, out outcome, what will be the, like the available or specific material, like if we, you are successful for making that particular material. So it means you have, uh, uh, you, that, that particular specific uh, product will be available or in the form of plantation, in the form of clean green area or the, in the form of survey or awareness, you must have some kind of database development. So what what is the impact of these these all these all the activities you, you are going and then you get it like if if you reduce the pollution environmental pollution that means like uh, uh, you can reduce the respiratory issues uh, in in the human beings that we are getting normally in the uh, in normally in our polluted areas so we we had a bad example of uh, from last three to five years about the smoke activities either in uh, Lahore or some other countries. So you can reduce this one and then you can impact on the uh, local community, local society. Or if you are a uh, pioneer of uh, that particular material, then you can easily uh, uh, impact on the export ratio. You can enhance this one, you can export this, this those products in all over the world. So you could be the pioneer if, if you are successful. So the, when you have this one, these all link with your KPIs, like key performance indicators. So these all, you, you must know that what exactly you are doing and then how you are doing, who is doing and uh, what you are getting from it. So this, this, these are linked with your uh, uh, KPIs. So as I started uh, from uh, earlier about like, uh, uh, you must be smart. You, you, you think must be smart. You have to think about it like the, what the reviewers thinking about your project. So either uh, it's not the like duplication of this, uh, any part, particular stuff like our it's like traditional stuff is going on. You you have to be think about it. As, as Sarah mentioned earlier, like uh, you have to be uh, specific with your, uh, your, uh, your questions. Like you have to link with your, uh, any kind of publication like if, if someone you reported that issue, so you have to hide that that one. So you have to know, you have to think like in a in a, in a some kind of innovative way, uh, because the traditional way is always going on. So by having or getting this uh, project, I will say you you have to think in a in a very smart way. In the in the next session, I will say like yes, you uh, you have to perform some kind of SWOT analysis. Uh, when you have done your project, then you have write down your project. You have to think about it. 
like uh, in the strength like what kind of strengths you have uh, in your organization have it and then what kind of qualities or strengths you have it so and then that is linked with your internal resources skilled knowledge stuff and then what, what are the hr costs you uh, hr personas you require and then that is linked with the weaknesses like does the organization have some kind of weaknesses or not you must know that and then uh, what kind of weaknesses you have it or what kind other competitors uh, can do better than you so because if you if you write something on the energy so you are the, not the only one who are who are writing something on energy or on the agriculture so there are many uh, expertise uh, in surrounding you so who are writing about so you have to be very uh, uh, like uh, smart uh, uh, while, while choosing the are availing this opportunities so resource limitation this is very important you have to mention this one i will say uh, because uh, by having this one you are getting uh, like different uh, you are opening the different doors uh, of collaborations so when you are writing this one or when you have this one so this opportunity is like uh, understand key issues like this this is again come up with your uh, main goal like what the funders required what the main key uh, thematic areas in which they are looking forward so you have to think about it uh, in relation to your discipline uh, like if i'm i'm the agriculturist so i i don't think so i have to write it something about uh, the energy or uh, some waste management because i i do not have the expertise about it so i have to think about it how i can link this one either your linkage is strong so you have to think about this one like next one is the few competitor like when you define this thematic area then you must know that like how many competitors you have it in that area like you have to know that like uh, in the energy like there are uh, 15 institutes and they are working over there and then out of this 15 institutes uh, these specific uh, peoples are working on this 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 particular areas you have to think about it you have to design this one so according to accordingly so emerging need for your products like uh, what the demand as i mentioned earlier like if you we are re removing the environmental pollution so this is our uh, demand right now so we have to think it like how we can do it and the and the last one we must have some kind of coverage by having some kind of seminars uh, conferences workshops and then uh, other media involved uh, to, uh, to publicize our our work and th th this is this is always missing uh, as i feel that like being a researcher we we always think in the research form so we ne we are not the good entrepreneur so we have to think about it like how we can sell our work how we can communicate our work so how we can deliver our work to to the people who who really need it so we have to think about this one clearly because uh, i feel i personally feel that like we are uh, this, this this section is is lacking in most of the scientists and the threat like uh, what kind of uh, uh, issues can be happen uh, while doing the experiment uh, experiments or while performing or implementing your projects so yeah, you have you have as i mentioned earlier like in the think assessment uh, uh, like uh, think before time so and then in the in the second one there is a changing regulatory environment like what kind of uh, basic requirements uh, what the funders require so you you have to read re re this one so sometimes these things happen we we completely write on the project, but unfortunately, we we forget uh, or or we overlook the activities that is uh, like uh, uh, what what the demand of the of your funding agencies. So this is important. So and then you you must know, know that like oh, your product is, is where it will go. So uh, at the end, it's always and then it's again linked with your uh, this particular. Uh, entrepreneur stuff so uh, next move we are moving towards the evaluation evaluation basically is the in-depth assessment of a project which is done in order to determine whether you are going uh, in a right direction or not or a project has achieved its goal or not so you have to be very careful about uh, while doing the evaluation so this this is always the key key aspect 
uh, that we have to determine or we we have to write on in our uh, notes somewhere. So like you have to perform this evaluation all the time throughout the uh, project. Like it's not like that, like at the end of the year, year or at the end of the project, I will do the evaluation. That, that means uh, that could end it with some kind of uh, unsuccessful stuff or un unsuccessful stories. So if you will perform, you have to define your goals, like uh, according to the, your uh, goals and activities, you have to evaluate, I will suggest at least you have to evaluate uh, uh, biannually. So every six months you have to evaluate like what you are doing and then what you are going to do in the coming six months. So, and then how, the, how your project is going on and then where it is going on. So th this is a, because when you are doing the evaluation, we can measure different type of activities like the, uh, like the efficiency, the impact, and then the effectiveness or sustainability uh, of your project. So there are multiple processes uh, we are measuring or de uh, designing while whenever we are doing the evaluation. Or this is this is the uh, I will say the uh, key of success. Uh, if we are thinking in the form of uh, reviewers. So if we if we will do the evaluation before submitting your project, so it means we can uh, we can easily assess multiple persons, either it's effective or not, or what, what's going on. So we are we are uh, we are falling over self. So uh, like uh, by having this evaluation, we can easily analyze like the either over over uh, like uh, our project is intended to what we we were thinking about it. So this 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 is this is kind of assessment test that we, if we will do it earlier, so we can get it. So I will I will let you know in uh, in bit detail about evaluation. What four or five parameters if we will uh, uh, assess uh, against our each activity, so we can easily evaluate our project either way which way do we will fall. So, uh, like in the evaluation, normally we have we must know the problem statement. So that is must link with some supporting statements also. Uh, like, uh, what will be the issue? So, but how you, how this issue is highlighted? So you have to know this particular uh, problem. Either this this is the problem or not. Not. So then. Uh, what is needed for change to happen? Like what kind of activities or objectives you have to take in to, 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 to resolve or to solve this particular problem. So, and then what do I plan to make change? Like what kind of activities I can do to perform this, uh, to avail or to achieve this goal. And then uh, uh, ultimately what results you have to speculate like uh, which activity, uh, which activities will get ended with what type of results. And then ultimately, uh, how I can evaluate progress. So when you have, when you define these all the parameters, you ultimately evaluate your each activities that is always linked with your, uh, your, your. I will say your your success in uh, getting the project. So as as we always know that like whenever we are writing something, so I'm, uh, writing some research articles. So everything is always in the funnel form. Like it started from the bigger, big story, and then it's ended with the with the narrow. Like what we found it. So this this is also some kind of uh, the same thing. Like we we try to resolve the big problem. How we resolve it, and uh, how we can manage this one. What will be the results, and then this is the product that we are going to deliver uh, to to the uh, stakeholders. And then uh, uh, th th this is just a, a simple chart. Like uh, if you've done your project, so you have to think about uh, this one, like what kind of problems are change, change is kind of objective. You are uh, achieving the activity of change, like uh, which kind of uh, outputs you are giving to get the objectives and then the expected, expected results mean the outcomes and then the impact on which society uh, we are impacting this, uh, this research. So by having this one, like in the GCF and then the LCF. So I will say that the important thing is the, uh, uh, like uh, the, it's a big opportunity for us uh, to, to collaborate with each other because uh, I, I believe that like uh, even if someone has uh, some expertise, I don't think so the nature is working over there. So it, it always linked with each other. 
So if if I am the uh, if I will say like I am the entomologist, I am working with the insects. So uh, there are hundreds of uh, aspects that we can study in the in the insects. While uh, when we are thinking about the management of the insects, so it's not like that. If I I do have some expertise in some some one aspect, so uh, I will I will lead everything. So th this grand challenge has a big opportunity for us to to avail or to think in a, in a different way, like in the thing in the multi-sectoral way, multi-dimensional like approaches that we can use it. We can link this one. Like if someone is doing the A activities, the other one is B, C, D, E, F, that all can link and then make something uh, good for everyone. So that, 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 that is the basically the theme of this particular GCL and then LCL. So we we have to like uh, all over the world. So we have to come up with this one. Like in the, in the national level and the international level, we have to we have a big opportunity to link this one. So before uh, going in detail about the others, so I will I will say like uh, uh, like it, it's again if we will plan uh, smartly and then we can evaluate smartly. So I think so that it's ended with the success of your story. So this, this is what I, uh, I would like to say about the like uh, project planning and the evaluation what, where we were thinking about it to discuss this. And then next we are going to discuss about my project that I was lucky enough to, to get that project in the, in the first phase of this year, last year. So uh, and then I'm lucky enough to, to stood, uh, one uh, in out of five uh, five uh, projects. So the my project was the uh, basically on the locust. Everyone knows that like in the last one and a half years we were faced this fear issue of this locust. So in the year two we can say it's a pretty deal. So what we can do in this project this is the uh, basic idea, uh, like uh, basic about the. Olfactory is the sense of smell, the response, and the most non fitting preferences of the gas and locus. There are a couple of uh, species of the, this particular locus, but in Pakistan, what we faced about this gas and locus is a, is a major uh, test that was causing the sphere loss. I will discuss this one later on uh, and how we can tackle this one. So, previously, in the, all over the world and then in Pakistan, ultimately, uh, we always based on. Uh, chemical application. So we we think that like this is the quick knockdown effect and the quick uh, activity to 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 overcome the issue of this particular any kind of test like this. This is one of them. So, but uh, uh, in this project we, we came up with some uh, different type of ideas like uh, how we can uh, tackle this particular uh, locus in 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 different way in. Uh, like uh, without harming the humans or the other uh, crops and the other other vertebrates. So we we will discuss this one later later slides. So like uh, we know that there was a major seven or crops and uh, breaks in the uh, uh, since 1912 till 2020. So in all over the world, and then the worst outbreak came uh, in 2020 in the last 70 years. That could be due to the reason of the global warming and then it could be the uh, bonfire in Australia, oil turns and then a heavy rainfall or no rainfall or abrupt rainfall in, in Middle East. So that is uh, again linked with the, with the economic, social and environmental uh, impact worldwide. So, and then I will say like the, the previous one and a half year, what we lost is, was, uh, around 3.5 billion us dollar we, we lost it in the uh, as uh, like uh, as the locus this particular came and then uh, they disturb and then effect over food security so this this is the basic uh, idea about it like uh, what what the major issues of this particular locus so we know then we narrowed on this one like there are around 10000 species of this grasshopper that is linked with the out of this one, there is around 80 to 21 species that are locust. Why they are locust? Because they can migrate over a long distances. And they can increase rapidly, and then they can uh, uh, travel 150 kilometer a day. So, 
uh, as we know that it's a devastating destructive species and then it's a it's a quite smart i will say uh, while traveling and then while uh, globally distributed geographically they are distributed around in different areas of africa asia in europe and then australia so they might they they travel from africa to asia so this is a very big distance they are covering and then ultimately by having this one they are impact over food security so th this is this is the main thing about the food, how we can uh, uh, save and then how we can uh, secure our food so by having this one we uh, we had the three major objectives like domesticate the olfactories that is the sense of smell and then acoustics is the sense of hearing communication with the locals how they can manage this particular uh, abilities and then by by working over there i hope we are expecting to have something good uh, other than that. And the second one is the wealthy intercooperation and then wealthy forecasting model about it uh, and then predict it uh, well before time uh, to get ready uh, to perform the activities and the last one is the uh, is the well the eco friendly strategies that is all linked with this uh, other two objectives so uh, these are the some some kind of methodologies like kind of uh, collections like volatiles non volatiles the pheromones that link with this some kind of uh, analytical analysis identification of compounds that is ended again with some kind of two nature experiments that is the one kind of electrophysiological and then the behavior this is the kind of electrophysiological setup where we uh, try to understand uh, kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, compounds that exist in the environment are favorable for that particular uh, in the locust. So we, uh, by having different, I will not go in detail about this one, but uh, uh, by having this one, we are getting different type of activities. What's, what, what exactly insects uh, going on in insects mind? So by having this kind of uh, this activity, so this is the first technique that we are implementing in Pakistan uh, in the in in our uh, discipline. Uh, and then next is the behavior experiment. So by having this one, we will have uh, like uh, in which direction the locust is moving. Like either they are moving in this, either this is the host, this is non-host. By having this type of activities, we are uh, we are determining the host and non-host in a in a in a common way we know that like uh, the locusts they eat everything so but there are few uh, examples of uh, about different type of crops or plants so on which they the locusts they, they don't feed so we were thinking to get some kind of uh, compounds that that are that can attract or repel this particular locust so by having this one so by identifying this one, we in this project we again linked our project with the nanotechnology. That is the again emerging technique in, uh, in the agriculture field, and then it has a different aspects like well, nano sensors, nano fungicides, uh, herbicides, and then uh, uh, fertilizers. But we are trying to focus on the insect pest management. That that is ended with the development of the nano formulations of uh, uh, any deterrent plant compounds or attractant plant compounds and it could be with the pheromones or it could be with the, any kind of bio pesticide that is in the pathogenic fungi normally this fungi is uh, uh, it's really effective but by having this technique and uh, nano embedded so we can increase the efficiency we can increase the efficiency and then we can increase the time bar time bar of this particular uh, this particular uh, compounds uh, for, and then it's also long lasting. So let's move forward about the other acoustic behavior. As we know that the, there are some different type of sonic waves exist in our, in our environment, like which is audible to us is the, uh, from 20 to 20,000 Hertz. And then, but there are some kind of infrasonic, ultrasonic and hypersonic. So uh, the, other than uh, sonic waves, so we cannot hear every, anything. So, but the other vertebrates and the invertebrates, they can, uh, or the mammals, they can hear other activities. So uh, other sounds. So by equipping this one, so we are trying to see our, our which wavelength is uh, really effective for either the attraction, well, the attraction of this particular locust or uh, are the in the form of a repellent, if we would say, uh, 
repel that particular uh, locus. So we, we, we are going to develop this technique uh, also uh, first time in Pakistan, I will say. So uh, in, in, in this discipline. So then we are going more forward about the other objective, like uh, uh, that's the linkage between the other breeding countries where the locus exists. So, and then there will be some kind of multivariate and then time series models for testing models that will help for the swarm formation, new emerging habitats, we can end it up and then we can easily predict it, get ready. That is also always linked with other uh, entrepreneurial activities, I will say like the uh, awareness activities, research policy papers, research activities, audit clips and then, uh, and then uh, develop some kind of seminars and workshops. So if I sum up some of this one, it means we are ended up with this, some kind of nano formulations of different type of material. And then we are forecasting the models. And then at the end, we will have some kind of uh, tracking devices or repellent devices for that is again, I will say linked with some kind of industry. These all are each products. So that is that we are going to deliver at the end of this project. So, by having this one, we were successful by developing this one, so we can uh, uh, trap this particular locus that we all well known that uh, like uh, these locus are the rich protein source. So we can provide those particular locus to the feed industries without using any particular any any kind of chemicals. So th 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 this would be the uh, real uh, end product for 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 uh, industry that can be utilized the protein that they are uh, importing from uh, from other countries so we can utilize here and then this is some kind of organization chart about like this is the furniture yeah, awesome. community yeah. university, university yeah. myself and the quality insurance is assessed by this HEC and then the Orica department UF over uh, academic academia collaborators like University of Pakistan, University of Karachi, University of Sin, Bahaudin Zika University, NEPCHI, award organization. There are different types of students and uh, farmers. Our sector collaborator is the Ministry of uh, National Food Security. Industry like the FBR group, they are working on the eco-friendly uh, strategies for the, for the management of uh, different insects. So again, the award is, uh, organization. So, And then some kind of uh, federal and provincial governments, they will get uh, a benefit from this uh, this research. So then uh, this is the, some just an overview of our implementation chart, uh, like uh, what type of activities we can do input, and then what outputs will be required, outcomes, and then the if there is any risk or not, and then time frame, and then who is doing this one, and within how much time they will complete this one, or this is also the same. Uh, like uh, there is, there could be a, some kind of risk. You have to be very careful. You have to define. It. So this is a, a kind of risk assessment. Like you, uh, what kind of risk, and then uh, how you can mitigate this one. So you have to, you have to be very clear about it. Like about your goals, your objectives, your activities, and then in relation to activities, what can uh, the risk can be happen. So how we can mitigate this particular activities. So this is what uh, I think so we have, uh, I had it today. So thanks a lot for listening. So uh, if there's any question or you, know, you may ask later on or you may uh, uh, send Thank me. you, Dr. Shahid, for your wonderful presentation on designing grand and local uh, challenge pro uh, projects. And uh, I'd like to invite our third speaker, uh, Dr. Hader Abbas, uh, to start off our second session on teaming up for a grand and local challenge. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. I think my screen is visible to you guys. Uh, uh, yes, it is, but it's not in presentation mode. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. So I think we are uh, we are running out of time. So I'll I'll be brief and concise with my presentation. So this is actually the second session that actually explains uh, how would you team up for the grand and the local challenge fund. And I'm Dr. Hyderabad Abbas from National University of Sciences and Technology, NAST, Pakistan. Uh, this is my brief profile. And the important thing is that uh, uh, I, uh, by the grace of almighty, I have won various 
international and national funding projects from different funding agencies from uh, USA, UK, Middle East, China, and Pakistan. And uh, yeah, and I'm also serving as associate editor for different of the uh, and the reviewers for different uh, funding agencies uh, around the world. So I have a kind of um, experience in evaluating the funding proposal also. So for today's presentation, it is uh, for the ideal and uh, GCF and LCF team, how it should look like and how you should be selective uh, with your team uh, for the PIs, principal investigators, the co-PIs and all the team members, the sectorial collaborators, industrial partners. How would you do this? Mainly it consists of uh, for, the, for the PI and the faculty members, then you have the uh, um, uh, sectorial and stakeholders from from different uh, industrial partners that we can see that is related to your project. The principal investigator, I would say the first one, this is the most important person for your project. So someone, for example, if you are going to propose a kind of novel idea that is related to artificial intelligence and its application is for example, in uh, defense sector, maybe in the banking sector and some of the other organization or the government sector, you can say. So the PI should be someone who has some kind of related experience that you are actually main, mainly you are proposing the whole some idea. Uh, the PI should be someone who is related to that and he who has some kind of uh, related work already published or maybe may available online that could be accessed this will be going to helpful for the for the evaluators then uh, you have to choose the faculty members uh, for the gcf let me let me clarify this thing for the gcf and lcf there are different requirements and eligibility criteria that i'll explain in the next slide but for the in general, the faculty members can be from the PIs, principal investigators, home institutions. It could be from other academic institutions in Pakistan. It could be the international academic institutions around the world. So you can you can you can get someone as you you can say consultant in your project, or maybe if 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 you can you want to take him uh, him or her as a, a co PI into your into your project. So let's take an example of a project that is uh, that is ha that has some kind of uh, application in, for example, banking sector. And the main idea or the core idea is the uh, intelligent, you can say, uh, mechanism that is going to going to be deployed. And the end product is the banking sector. So the ideal team could be the PI, someone has some kind of uh, experience with the artificial intelligence mainly. It's uh, like the deep learning and all, all, of the, all of the machine learning kind of, or you can say the artificial intelligence methods, right? And now you see that there is uh, some kind of uh, co-PIs that you needed. You can choose from your organization right your, your university or maybe from some other universities so it is better to team up with other universities like for example there are some research intensive universities uh, defined by the HEC I'll, I'll explain this in the, in the next slides that are those are the universities that are that has some kind of significant you can say baseline for the research and HEC has graded them as a research in intensive universities in Pakistan. So you can choose someone from there. And there are some kind of other universities, also the weaker universities, you could say. I, I, mean, I, must, I must not say the weaker universities, but some of the other universities that, that you can choose the team from there also. The people should be a kind of more related to the core idea that we are, we are for, for example, proposing, right? And then for the industrial, uh, you can say the academic institutions, international academic institution, you can choose someone, uh, for example, from uh, some somewhere from England or some, some of the other country that has some kind of direct experience with your, your core idea, right? As we said that the, the application should be for the banking sector Right for the sectorial collaborators, you can 
choose the private enterprises, ministries, and other public sector authorities, chamber of commerce, trade groups, and professional associations, hospitals, policymakers. So, in this specific example, that that for the artificial intelligence, for the intelligent mechanisms for managing, for example, users' data, or you can say the 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 bank's clients into commercial organization. The most appropriate, uh, you can say, organization could be the Chamber of Commerce or maybe some of the banks in Pakistan, right? So some in the, someone, someone from industry or the sectorial, uh, you can say the sectoral collaborator will be the someone who is going to impart the knowledge from the industry that is going to help you in your project. He has actually the hands-on experience with 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 all the, the you can say the, uh, at, at the gross root level he is going to to help you in your project in in different stages right so this team uh, as as i mentioned here let me go to the previous slide here so the pi the faculty members from uh, these research intensive universities or the other universities and the sectorial stakeholders, consultants, right? You can build a, a strong team that is that actually reflects their expertise in the core area of uh, you can say the idea that you are proposing for uh, for the, for you for your GCF or the LCF. Okay, so if you you see that uh, uh, for the uh, for the LCF and GCF, there is some variations, or you can say there's some guidelines from the HEC. For the GCF, uh, the principal investigator should be the faculty member at research intensive institutions in Pakistan. And HEC has issued a list of research uh, intensive institutions. Uh, it is available on the HEC website. So the, for the GCF, it should be from, uh, the PI should be from, from these institutions. And the co-PI or the consultant could be from the consultant. Uh, ideally, the consultant should be from the industry, right? Or the, or the sectoral, uh, you can say the collaborators. And the co-PI should be from other universities uh, within, within Pakistan or maybe uh, outside Pakistan, right? And then uh, for, the, for the LCF, that is local challenge fund, there are two kind of uh, proposal that 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 could be submitted to that number one is element one for the element one the actually the main focus is uh, the research capacity and contributing to the research mission of the host institution right so for this specific element one for the lcf right you have to actually uh, choose a principal investigator that is uh, that is working as a regular faculty from the uh, from from the university but but it is not included in the list of research intensive institutions. So HEC is actually, or the, the, the LCF is actually encouraging the, you can say the weaker universities to, to come up with their, with their own uh, local problem that could be resolved by, by this funding. And also there's other, other um, uh, requirement that the, for, the, for the LCF, uh, the team should be, uh, one copy I should be from uh, a research intensive uh, organization, you can say the institution. So the team should be the mixture of these. And for the element two, the, the, the LCF says that the focus primarily on addressing a local challenge of Pakistan, right? And for this specific, uh, you can say, uh, elementary or this specific, uh, you can say, uh, the criteria that that says the principal investigator for LCF element two proposal must be a faculty member from from the higher institution that is included in the list of research intensive institutions, and the the co PI should be from uh, should, should be from any of the weaker university. It should not be from the research intensive uh, institution. I, and I think this is a very, very good mixture of uh, mix and match of uh, the faculty member and their expertise. So uh, they wanted that everyone from the research intensive universities and the weaker universities should take part into this initiative and, and get benefit from, uh, from, from this uh, funding. 
Uh, next is the, the the some tips and tricks uh, for for this teaming up. So you actually have to include junior and senior academic staff. So it's better. So it should be the mixture of both, because we know that the, there are there are, there are many of the the, the newcomers. Or you can say the recently graduated uh, PhDs who has the more more um, research intensive work, and they are. Uh, recently, you can say, uh, got in touch with all of the, uh, you can say the research areas so that they are more updated, you can say. You can, uh, and senior is definitely is, is the heavyweight and they have the more experience and all the knowledge and everything in the area. So it could be the mix of, uh, mixture of these both two. Then uh, you can also include both male and female researchers into your team. So this is also a tip for the for your team. Uh, so the find implementation partners for your project is uh, how would you find uh, the implementation partner for your project? There could be many ways that uh, you can go with this. Uh, for example, you can find partners within the consortia of projects already funded by the HEC. Uh, according to your research area, or maybe you can attend some kind of partnering event. For example, there is some kind of kind of events by by the the banking sector, or maybe you can fund for the defense industry, or maybe you can say some of the the partners are arranging some kind of webinars online, or there are different kind of so they, where the where the industry is heavily involved, and the people are available. Uh, for the collaboration so that or maybe you can use your university's auric office for this purpose also there are many universities in pakistan i know that has the iabs that is uh, industry academia board advisory advisory boards already uh, within the universities so that could also that channel could also be used to uh, to find some kind of implementation partners and for this, uh, uh, for to convince a partner, actually uh, you have a clear project uh, fact sheet that what will be the output, what will be the KPIs, and what will be the end product, which is the deliverables that could, how and how it is going to benefit the community. Uh, also, the the pitching of the project should be good and attractive, uh, mailing to the contact potential partners is actually. Uh, the potential partner is actually going to help you uh, to provide a test bed for your for your project, right? And it's very important. For example, you develop something uh, for agriculture, right? And you need some kind of uh, implementation partners who can actually demonstrate your project and give you some kind of feedback that how it is it is going to work. So this was all from my side and I'll uh, I hand over to Dr. Kashif who is the next speaker and will add more to this. Thank you very much. Okay, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. So I will just add up on what uh, Dr. Heather already has uh, shared. So I will be quick uh, and uh, not take much of time. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Heather. So I think Dr. Heather have covered the major part uh, of the uh, of the teaming up. It is very important uh, that uh, that we normally uh, I think all of the parts are equally important. We normally pay more attention on uh, actually proposal writing, but actually the team which is actually going to execute this project is very important. And some of the aspect Dr. Heather has already covered, but the partner selections are very important as well. So quickly, uh, just uh, this is me, Dr. Kashif Kifai from Air University. So uh, I have both as Dr. Heather, uh, both have experience of the UK, EU and Pakistan uh, research grants. So I've completed around eight uh, research projects as a PI. And uh, these are the funding that I have won uh, in UK, EU, EU and, and Pakistan. Uh, okay, so on GCF, I will, uh, plan was that I will go through the questions that uh, are mentioned uh, in the proposal. And there are key points that they have already asked these questions that you have to address in the proposal. So you could see that in the partnership, the partner you are selecting, academic partner normally easy to select. But similarly, in GCF, the nature of the project is quite big and the impact is big. 
So the number of the partner will goes on the basis of that. We make a lot of mistakes in selecting the partners. Normally, we select the partners which are uh, obviously the people you know and things like that, and you normally team up with them. But in order to do that, uh, you have to actually uh, you have to sit and think properly that if this project is actually executing in the real time, who you will require actually to execute. And the expert wise and then management wise both. So this is something that you need to send. So these are the question points I've highlighted. Uh, I will not spend too much time on these that do you have to actually select before these things as well. And then you need to search uh, even those the people you don't know, you, ha you have to actually look into the track record and trying to contact them and bring them on board. And normally, uh, whenever you're contacting the partner, normally you, you write a brief, you write a summary of, the, of your proposal explain the key goal and objective of the vision of the project, and then explain the duration. And then you send this summary to the partner and obviously they will love to engage with you, okay? Now, again, uh, there are other things with these partners uh, in terms of the, what they are bringing to the project as well. Sometimes they bring direct financial support. In other cases, they bring uh, support in kind. Support in kind mean that they will actually add the time that they will give one day, half a day to your projects. So for those things, I will explain you what is the evidences you have to give. Uh, I would love to actually have show you some EU project that I had, but uh, obviously due to time shortage that we have another uh, respected international speaker online. So I won't take too much time. So I will quickly skip uh, to the slide as well. Okay, again, um, it is very important that you select the relevant partner. For example, if you are doing the project in medicine, so obviously uh, it's sensible that you add doctors and hospitals and uh, you know, pharmacists, these kind of things that they will be as a, your partner. And that will naturally uh, hook up uh, with your goal and target. And that will add value to your proposal. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, it won't cause any problem. Sometimes you put the partner which has no relevance as well. So this justification is very difficult. And that create doubts and risk of uh, actually executing that project as well. Okay. So sectoral uh, already um, Heather explained and also about academic partners, he has already explained. So I will just go to the next point. Our team capacity, again, I will explain on my summary slide, that is very important. How you will justify, for example, that's a question that what, how you reflect the team capacity in a proposal as well. So what, what, what step you will do? And normally you actually um, add their CVs and the track records by linking them. So look, this guy has experienced that many years. So, uh, and, and that will actually give a very professional opinion or input in your project. Okay. So capacity wise is very important that you also clearly reflect that in your proposal. Now coming to the uh, project leader, uh, you know, the leadership that how actually, you know, they, they will support uh, the project leadership. Normally they give you the consent letter that you have to have uh, along with your proposal when you're submitting them. Again, the resources I've already explained. Academic partner, Dr. Heather, already, already covered. How to LCF. Now, LCF and GCF, as already Dr. Heather mentioned, LCF, you will increase your chances of winning the proposal if you are addressing a Pakistan problem. I mean, I'm telling you, it is a social problem, it's a technology problem, it's a, any kind of a problem which is relevant, directly reflect. So who will be the person you will be bringing them? So the people normally, the user, the end user who face this problem will be actually also your, you know, the main partner in your project who will regularly stay there and actually execute this project. So these are the quick key points. I will share the slides and that obviously uh, you can then go through them, but I will quickly jump to my last slide to actually cover the key crux points, which I would like to highlight. Okay, these are the similar point which GCF has covered. Now this slide, I would like uh, just take one or two minutes on this slide. Look, uh, it's very important that when you executing your research grant, is that kind of the project you are doing, is that will be completely successfully through academic partner? If the question is yes, go ahead for academic partner only. But if you think that you need actually, uh, 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 your project needs some sort of a trial, some sort of a actually uh, end user, which actually they will use it and industries already exist in Pakistan. So then you have to actually 
add industry in to it that will add the value in some cases you need a governmental organization for example you are working on um, xyz problem which is relevant to organization a governmental organization you can bring on the board again an end user in in some cases people actually not even bother that to, to bring the end user on the, as a partner as well you can bring end user as a partner as well so you can create a small group working group of a user who will actually give regular input in your project okay type type is done how you will prove you know the team track record that's you will attach their cvs experience letter how the partner will contribute normally partner will contribute you will have you have to have justification as a letter with financial figures normally financial figure does not mean they have to actually contribute financially that's very good if they have sometime they say contribution in kind so for example if they are giving one day of their work and they are involving two or three employees of their uh, uh, their company so how much will that time cost that you will write the total for example your project is duration for 3 years and that person is giving you for example 50000 per month as uh, you know uh, for for their time so that will be 6 lakhs per year and 18 lakh per uh, for the whole project for 3 years so that will be 18 lakh of contribution in kind okay again there will be other contribution they will let you actually use their lab you will actually you know use their premises and thing like that you have to clearly highlight highlight in the in the in the project now another important evidence that you need to prove part of the question which i have covered how you involve engage the partner in your project so for example you say look i will just these are my partner but there is no evidence that how you are engaging them in your so there are some tips that you can follow you can involve them in a project management you can you can put them in your steering committee of the project they will be in your steering committee reviewing your project giving input every 3 months 6 months interaction between partner you need to clearly highlight in your project plan how you will interact with the partners and also the partner has to give regularly quarterly report to you okay another tip obviously uh, dr hader already mentioned geolocation also matter you need to make sure that you also put some of the area uh, in this project which are not obviously very well developed so for example you can include balochistan kashmir other area where uh, you need to you from through your project these area could be developed as well and gender equality already dr hader has mentioned so i think what it is important is uh, the last thing the last sentence i will uh, close my uh, presentation is that whatever the questions clearly mentioned in these guidelines available by hcc you need to find the answer that this is your proposal has cover those or not okay i would have loved to have to actually show you some proposal uh, where uh, these things are covered evidently uh, but i'm afraid i uh, obviously have to uh, close this up uh, again thank you very much uh, uh, for all uh, thank you for presenting and those who are listening and the last speaker who's coming behind me again apology for our making you wait as well and thank you very much again everyone thanks bye bye uh, thank you dr kashif for your presentation uh, now i'd like to introduce our last speaker for the session dr jawad dar a professor of uh, materials chemistry and head of uh, clean um, uh, materials technology group uh, university college london uh, so the floor is yours assalam alaikum everybody uh, can you hear me clearly uh yes sir you are audible okay yes. uh is the uh screen looking okay unfortunately i have this as a powerpoint so i'm not sure how big it shows up is it showing up big enough um yes we can see the slides okay so uh i think uh i've been listening to all the other speakers so uh, uh i mean it's very difficult going last when you have such uh, excellent speakers so i want to thank the previous speakers and I'm sure it's a very long day for all of you. So, so let's really just try and cover some of the points that haven't been covered. So, as as uh, the introducer said, my name is Jawad. I am professor of materials chemistry at UCL. I'm British Pakistani. I run a charity called Upsign, which you may have heard about. But uh, if you want to check out more about it, uh, we work to connect uh, Pakistanis worldwide in academia, basically. Uh, okay. So, look, um, what is the uh, the key thing that I've learned I I've had over 20 I've been involved in over 20 million worth pounds worth of 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 research funding I've I've led large consortia myself I've been involved in large consortia of 
unfortunately, if I was to stick to 15 minutes, I wouldn't be able to share everything with you today, but I think I'll try and cover the bits that weren't covered, okay? And this applies to all general consortia. I know this is about GCRF and LCF, and much of this, uh, I will make sure it's relevant, what I do talk about. So uh, let's skip to the main thing. Um, the previous speaker spoke about, uh, you know, make sure you get the right sort of people together, and that's absolutely correct. Let's decide, let's uh, imagine that you've got your consortium now and you've got all the right people with the right expertise. Uh, we'll talk about the mixture of gender and age as well. I, I want to cover that a little bit, but I know it's already been partially covered. The really important thing is management, right? Management is incredibly important. You, you as the PI, you know, these are reasonably big projects. Are they, no, these are big projects for Pakistan. You as the PI, it's really important how communication happens from the people at the bottom to the people at the top, okay? So clearly there's always a core management group, but then generally you're working with some sort of work package leaders. Uh, you're working with external business, maybe companies uh, uh, or partners, as we've already discussed, and you probably have an advisory board as well. And you, you could also have your business development or your Oryx, as you would call them, right? So these are technology transfer people. And that some of these arrows are two ways. Okay, in fact, all of these arrows are really two-way arrows. It's not a one-way communication. It's usually two ways. What's really important is that the um, that there's sometimes there's going to be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. So how are you going to facilitate um, the discussions that happen between work packages? Because we don't want work packages to work in silos, and often that is what happens. You have one institution, let's say Faisalabad over here, Nust over there. Generally, you know, you have a big project. You've got your millions. You all work on your own thing, and every now and then you get together and have a chat. That's not what you want. What you want is that Feslabad and Nust are constantly talking to each other. Their researchers are talking to each other. They're, they're doing things together that they can't do on their own, and that's the whole point of having a consortium, right? It's not to put together the, the sort of um, you know super team, and then everybody runs off and does their own thing. So you have to show how the institutions are working together and how you are facilitating knowledge and information. Because when there are problems, how does the, the PI find out about these problems, okay? If he's sitting or she's sitting in his, in his or her office and they, you know, they never get to hear about these problems, that's not a good thing. So you need good communication. And so really, look, this diagram is just my example of showing you that you don't have to have a sort of, you know, pre, one of the previous speakers spoke about, you know, you, oh, you must have it every two weeks, this and that. Well, actually, the every two weeks meeting might be, depending on the size of the consortium and how you, you feel is best, um, you know, th th there can be different levels of meetings, but certainly the whole team should be getting together. I mean, if this is a big team. So in the UK, a team of this size would be about 10 million pounds. Um, now, the Dr. equivalent- Dr. Jamaat, can you zoom in on the screen? The screen is too, too, too small okay. to read. How's that one? Is that better? Just put, put, put it in the presentation. Yeah, this is better. Okay. Uh, with with the um, PowerPoint, I don't know whether, it's, but I will keep it this size. If that's all right. Okay. So, um, so look, the, the key thing here is at your different levels within your work packages, you want to have your regular meetings. Then you want to be having uh, the opportunity where there are ad hoc meetings, where this could be between junior researchers at the bottom. And so, define your structure, define your the communication, define the roles. So we have work package leaders. So here's DK is the lead of work package one, XY is the lead of work package two, KH is the lead there. We have our co-investigators involved and, and our PDRAs or PhDs. And then of course we might have our PhD students at the bottom there. And of course the idea is to make sure that they're working so they're able to, to, to and you need to show this graphically. So this is one way of showing it graphically and you could write it in words, of course, right? Okay, so um, the other thing, so really talking about management and frequency, uh, how do you manage a big consortium? And, you, and how are you going to show this to the reviewers? Well, you're going to talk about regular meetings. Uh, you want to have something like a risk register. And somebody already sort of alluded to a researcher. I'll show you a version of my risk register just very quickly. So, you know, do your junior teams meet weekly? So that this could be between Nust and Fesselabad, could be chatting weekly on an on a online chat just to get, you know, keep on top of what they're doing to collaborate between the different universities. What about your work package meetings? Are they monthly? Your full quarterly meetings? And of course you have your annual meetings, your advisory steering group meetings. How often is, is right? You know, is it six months? Is it one year? 
And actually, what is the role of an advisory or steering group? Do, are you compelled to take their recommendations or are you just treating us well? They're giving us advice. We can ignore it or not. Now, how does that work? The people you've chosen on the advisory group, what are they, why have you chosen those people? You need to explain that as well. You know, why are these experts? Are they just your friends or are they people who actually genuinely, are they people from industry? Are they people from academia? So you need to sort of define what that committee's role is. And, you know, too many committees might be complicated and of course, are you having some kind of annual review where which would coincide with your quarterly meeting, which is the full group meeting, but it might also every every full annual review, you may invite other people in as well, subject to confidentiality. And of course, you could also use your annual review to do some kind of conference that could be uh, have closed sessions, which are private for your consortium, but also open sessions where you try to uh, bring in potential new partners because look just because you've got funding on day one for 10 people to be funded on this project doesn't mean you stop engaging with the community or the stakeholders the end users or whoever you you need to keep open channels so that they have the opportunity to come and engage and they may be able to offer you something and they, they don't have to be there at the beginning so show that you're open okay people have already talked about how trying to look at projects where you can be supporting people in their careers uh, particularly gender is, is probably highlighted. And in the UK, we, we have much more um, things about, ED, we, we call it EDI, which is ethnicities and diversities and inclusion. So in the UK, it's, uh, UK it's much more complicated than maybe in Pakistan. Some of these things you probably don't even look at, uh, you know, you wouldn't even consider them. And, and I'm not saying you should, but I think the two big ones are age and gender in particular. And uh, what you have to do is to, and, and the other ones, I'm going to leave it for you to decide whether you think they're relevant in a Pakistani context, okay? But certainly, you know, you want to be supporting early career people as well as people in their mid or late careers. You, so don't, don't just have a bunch of old men basically on your consortium as, and don't put all the old men as the work package leaders. And I mean, look, if you've got a dynamic uh, young or mid-career male or female who is, can do the job you just as long as you justify they've got the experience that you know they maybe haven't got the management experience but of course that's why they're on the project and that's what you're doing is you're supporting someone to have get management experience because how else are they going to get it right so you know you can make a thing of that saying you know we've appointed this this lady who is a you know she's uh, got a phd within the last five or ten years that he or she has already done some great work so you know make make a thing of that and, and actually that that actually improves your um uh, it, well it, it helps the project i'm sure because having diverse views from different uh, uh perspectives is a is actually going to make your proposal better um one particular thing is training so what so with these uh, junior researchers phds postdocs or even junior members of faculty staff what are you doing to help them so that they become those big leading academics one day in the in the top institutions that might be research active you know what are you doing to support them so what you need to do is have a, first of all you need to have an environment within your proposal so the environment in the university may not or the universities may not be uh, like you want it to be for some large proposal so you need to sort of have maybe bring in training and expertise that is for your for your people okay you need to make sure that if there's people uh, you know how do you address uh, you know particularly when you're working with international uh, you bring in international travelers they're going to be looking at this kind of thing you know if, the, if, the, if you imagine if you have an international visitor they come along and you've got people behaving badly not not with the, what i would call academic uh, sort of behavior you know good academic behavior it reflects badly on you and and and, and people go back and tell everybody else about it so it's really important that you give opportunities for uh, like you could be teaching them to write grants, uh, you could be teaching, you could be putting them through training that allows them to behave ethically towards uh, women or junior members of staff, because of course we all know about the power dynamic between senior, uh, usually men, and, and junior women or junior academics, okay, so the, you know we've got to address this, we've got to make sure everybody understands that the, the kinds of behaviours that we're going to expect, and you'd say well we should know this because we're Muslims and we understand this, but actually you'd be surprised. And I think that um, particularly the sexual harassment uh, and bullying, I know, I know this is a word that nobody likes to use in Pakistan and some vice chancellors have positively said you are not allowed, we don't, we're not interested in this training, but I, I, I strongly urge you to look at uh, how you train your leaders, your young people to become leaders um, and, and you know, how to network. So this is very important with industry. Industry, 
generally in Pakistan, what we know, I've been visiting for a long time now, I know the industry is not quite sure how to work within academia and, and vice versa. And so really, uh, you can maybe run some training courses. I've run them in Pakistan in the past. How, how do we network with industry? How do we get them interested in this proposal? They, they may not realize that we can help them to maybe make more profit, produce less waste, be more sustainable. So, you know, how do you actually start those interactions? So this sort of training is really good, maybe data protection as well. Um, so um, I'm not going to talk more about industry advisory board. I've already talked about that. Um, but what I would say is letters of support, we've already mentioned, um, you know, how do you follow up from the advice and how often do you meet them? Now, letters of support, I'm going to just click to another page now. Uh, a previous person has said, well, you know, letters of support, you shouldn't really be writing them. You should let the industry write them. Even in the UK, where industry and academia uh, work relatively well together, you would be surprised how industry is, A, hasn't got the time, and B, even if they're interested, they just write terrible, terrible letters of support, okay? So I'm going to be honest and tell you how I do it. And not everybody would agree with my methods, but this is what I do, okay? So what the first thing is, the, uh, I would send them a, a draft. I would talk to them obviously about the proposal and I would share that information through either a networking event or maybe I, some, uh, the last time I actually just sent them a short video with, a, with an email and I sent them a video explaining about the proposal. I only sent it to certain companies that I really like or that are friends of mine or that I, that I respect that I think would be interested. And I sent that video and I said, if you want to talk to me, let's, let's have a chat. We have a chat. They tell me where they'd like to import, where they think they can add value etc cetera, etc cetera. so on that basis i would then go away and i would write a, a covering letter that would cover their contribute uh, sorry a letter of support that covers their contribution i write the first draft i definitely do not write the final draft in that first draft i basically introduce the company and they usually will completely change that anyway right but it, what i'm telling the company is you need to talk about yourself first tell us about the company and the priorities and to be honest sometimes i just get it off the internet because it's there the second thing I do is once we've had that discussion and agreed on what we're going to do, I will break down what that company is offering in a number of bullet points. But the important thing is in-kind value. And I will say that here we've got, it says offer of in-kind support of 50 of at least for 50K over four years. So that's 50,000 pounds over four years for this particular activity. Now, most often, if you can get an assigned value to something, and not sometimes companies are not willing to commit to an in-kind number. They'll just say, look, we'll do it. We're interested. We're not going to put a value. That's fine. But if you can get them to commit, it shows actually shows more commitment in my case. And we'll match a PhD student funding with 55,000. Uh, so if the university puts in 55, we'll put in 55, and we'll, we'll fund a student partially. So these are the types. So this is a real commitment, right? This is a real commitment to put in money if the university puts in money. And again, can you get your university to offer up a studentship or whatever they've got? Um, so look, th this is how I do it. And I even put a total in that letter and it has to be signed, properly signed. And it has to be. So the key things are when you ask your collaborator, say you send them it, you say, can you put it on headed paper? First of all, can you please make sure you, you date it? And can you please make sure you sign it? And of course, please read the letter, make sure you're happy, change anything you want to change. Um, what is relevant here, and I didn't mention that, is why is this company interested? So this is what they do in the beginning. This, we do this electric cars. And we're interested in this because of dot, dot, dot. Okay, that is what a good letter of support looks like. Please don't draft them all so they look exactly the same because that's really stupid because your reviewers will just go, okay, all of these are exactly the same. There's no point. So look, I'm just being honest, right? I could quite easily say to you, oh yeah, go and get your industry to write them. But I bet you most of the industry wouldn't have a clue how to write them. And frankly, you may waste a lot of time trying to explain it to them. That's how I do it. Everybody's got their own choices, okay? Now you can also get uh, academic letters of support, which maybe don't really have to have an in-kind value. They just have a commitment. So the numbers there are not so important, I would say, okay? Okay, so um, the other thing I want to just mention is things like sprints and marathons. So look, you have this local challenge or grand challenge. One of the good ways of working together is to, like what you can do is you can get, let's say work package one and work package two. They could work together in what I would call a sprint or a marathon. So generally this might be four to eight months for a sprint and a marathon is one of these longer term objectives. It could be one of your sort of big, big, big objectives in the project, grand challenge or local challenge objectives. And these may be over a year or longer. The beauty of working in a sprint is that you could organize some of your meetings according to sprint number one, sprint number two, and sprint number three. 
And the beauty is that you will have people from different universities and different work packages coming together to try and address a sprint because you're, it's, a, it's a shorter, focused effort. So let's imagine your big, uh, your big uh, thing was to, I don't know, produce biopesticides. Now, within producing biopesticides to, to help Pakistan for agriculture, you might have a sprint that involves um, you know, trying to do some manufacturing or something around you know, an effort that requires several work packages to come together. So that would be a sprint. And then uh, a longer term objective of the marathon could be producing the first pesticide that's been tested. So testing itself could become part of, um, you know, a, a, a sprint, a, you know, smaller type of thing before you get to the main objectives, which is to sort of validate or, or, or do some bigger, bigger proofs work. Now, risk registers, you have generally some kind of uh, item or description. You have the risk and you have the impact. So the, the risk and impact are either going to be low, medium, and high. And, and the traffic light, I've used these colors, which I think is really useful. Now, where you have a high risk, so let's say you had a red in this column here and a high uh, uh, impact, that means that if something like this was a pro became a problem, then uh, the, the red and the red is, is potentially something that's a kind of like a, it, it could probably ruin the project or mean failure in, or partial failure in the project. So you really want to identify the risks. So the likelihood is the risk. So in this case, there's a low likelihood that the lack of cooperation with local farmers, but if you didn't get um, the, it, but it's very important that you get that. And if you didn't get that, there, there would be a high chart. I mean, the project can't really uh, succeed without that, um, without that. But, but luckily it's not a very risky thing. It's very likely that will happen. So there's a low risk. So, you know, think about what risk and impact or hazard mean, okay? So the influence is, is, the, is the impact. And when you multiply them together effectively, you know, you could give them a number and anything that's a red and a red is one that's kind of, one that you've got to worry about. And of course, a risk register is something that you keep doing throughout the project. You can do one at the beginning, just like you can do a SWOT analysis at the beginning to look at your team and the quality of your team. And you should, and the previous speaker, one of them mentioned the SWOT analysis. I would be doing a SWOT analysis throughout the project as well. And not just before to identify where your weaknesses are in your proposal. Um, so look, keep doing that. Networking, I'm really big on networking. Um, you know, you need to find ways of interacting with the community. So you've been awarded a big GCRF or LCF project. If you just work with the same few universities and you do not talk to anybody else outside, that's absolute no-no. So your impact comes from talking to the community. Why not set up a network? If you're doing energy storage, if there's no energy storage network or battery network in Pakistan, why don't you set one up? Any, anybody who gets an, a GCRF or LCF project, in my view, should be setting up, if there's not an existing one, a network to try and disseminate information and to also just get ideas from people, you know, within the literature, I mean, not, not sort of steal ideas, of course. So, you know, this is benevolence. This is about how you, uh, you know, this is how you uh, show that you're worth this money that you're being given by, by not just sticking between you and your mates, okay? It's, you know, you must think wider and don't expect anything in return. Don't think, well, they come to this meeting, they have to do something, they have to work with us now. No, it's not like that. That's not how academia works, okay? The, the networking also gives you some industry perspectives that are not, and, and of course, you only share the non-confidential information. Don't share anything you're gonna patent, of course, but there's plenty you can share, I'm sure. Maybe if you have some uh, money available or some collaboration, you might even look at offering some small collaborative opportunities as well. And um, obviously, Part of your outreach is your key, your key performance indicators and monitoring. So, you know, are you interacting with enough? I mean, maybe you're doing work with schools. And I always, again, I always recommend you should have a good outreach program. You should be looking at educating the younger generations as well. Maybe creating online content to share uh, some learning with schools or other institutions or universities. Okay, so don't just think, yeah, it's just purely research. I, I don't see why you can't do a little bit of outreach and work with masters and other students. So look, Conclusions are have a clear structure and lines of communication of what you want to do in the project, uh, how you're going to get regular input, and you obviously want to create a very strong international academic culture where harassment or any of any kind or, or you know the good academic international norms are, are done. I mean, we are actually at Upsign, 
we're actually working on a training course for uh, Pakistani academics in collaboration with Pakistani academics and others. And that's something we think that is, is really needed. And if you're doing that individual on your projects, I'll be really interested to talk to you about that in the future, uh, because we're going to do something hopefully with one of the HECs. Now, uh, so, so really look, uh, try to empower the youth and uh, all genders. Uh, so look at particularly supporting uh, dynamic uh, people who are already shown to, to, to have a, a, a good quality about them and uh, constantly look at your risk register, constantly do your SWOT analysis, revise it as you go along, help other people and do not expect anything in return. So this is how we work to international standards and we are inclusive, okay? So really, really important. Uh, thank you for that. And, and I think we're five minutes over, but uh, I think I'll stop there. Um, thank you, Dr. Jawab, for that uh, wonderful detailed uh, presentation. Uh, we'll start with, off with the Q&A now. Uh, participants uh, kindly either type your questions in the chat box or uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and followed by your questions. So I see there's there was one question um, um, in, in the chat, uh, difference between outputs and outcomes. We had a session on theory of change and building a logical framework for your interventions, outputs, outcomes, and impact. Uh, please do refer to that session. It was done uh, uh, actually two sessions back. Uh, but if you can see the screen, uh, when, when we talk about outputs in, in, a, in a research uh, project design, we're talking about tangible products or services produced as a result of the activities, which are the interventions you're planning on doing, uh, which usually uh, outputs can be counted. Uh, as far as intermediate outcomes are uh, uh, concerned, we, we refer to the short-term behavioral changes that result from the outputs, uh, preventive health habits, uh, usage of tablets, et cetera, et cetera. And then, we differentiate outcomes from goals and long-term impact, uh, long-term uh, changes uh, that ultimately uh, result from the outcomes uh, of a program uh, is what we refer to as impact. But I highly recommend our session uh, on theory of change in which we, we've talked about the logical framework and building this entire uh, uh, logic model uh, and defining KPIs and means of verification of those KPIs in detail. Uh, uh, Ahad, if you can see in the chat, there are a couple of other questions, uh, or perhaps we can just uh, take uh, questions live. Uh, if people can raise their hands, we would be very happy to respond to them. Uh, yes, there is one question. Um, it's from Saira Banu. Is it necessary that the PI and co-PI have the same expertise in which subject area they made the proposal? Like if PI has expertise in biology and they start working in different field, is it acceptable for any project? Yeah, Dr. Jawad, I'd let you take that one. You're mute. Dr. Jawad, you're mute. I, I, I'm sorry, I just about caught that because there's a bit of bagging outside. I think the question was, should, can the uh, PI has to be the expert in the main project proposal idea, right? Is that correct? Right, and then they have given an example that if someone is in biology, uh, expertise is in biology, and they, they are uh, working on a different project, uh, perhaps, uh, is it possible? It, you know, so, so, okay, so my question is, how different is the project? Uh, is it a project within biology, but they're just not the specialist in that area? Is that, is that what we mean? Or we do we mean it, they're a biology specialist and the, and the subject is in maths or something? So, so how different is the expertise in the project? Give me, give me a scenario. Okay, well, look, before that scenario, what I would answer is this. If you have somebody who is an experienced researcher, like a senior experienced researcher who's managed big projects successfully, then they, of course, could be the PI. They don't have to be the, the brains behind the operation, right? I always say the younger people, the junior staff, or even the senior staff are the brains, and it's the team, right? So, so to me, there should be no, as long as you justify, you say, look, this person, and we do this in the UK all the time, right? We generally will have somebody, I, I've even been in a situation where I wrote the proposal, but I put my senior academic, uh, like my dean, who was more senior than me, published three times as many papers in similar areas. But I would say I was a, I was a, uh, I'm not saying I'm a better leader than him, but some, having somebody like that at the top of the tree 
uh, gives the reassurance because they are very good at managing and they've managed many projects before and they're very good at it. And, and actually they're very good at time management. So they make sure meetings are not long, you know, they're very to the point. So I quite like having someone that, like that, even if he's not the best scientist in this area. But what you have to do is to show that the next level down, that the team is strong enough. So even if you say this person is leading, you must justify this person is leading because they're a super duper manager. They're going to make sure that we, you know, do this properly. And they're also important because they have the, uh, the, the, the gravitas and, and the, the, the reputation, uh, which is, which is going to bring in more collaborators and, and more industry, you know, so there are reasons to appoint these people, right? So, but generally don't appoint someone who's way past it and send me retired and you put them there because it looks like, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm trying to think of an example. And all I could think of was Atta Rahman, but <laughs> he's the only really old senior uh, professor I know. <laughs> but uh, look, make sure that, you know, they're there and they're doing a genuine leadership role in a management role, because that's kind of a, a job that's not for anybody who hasn't got experience. Let's be honest. Right. So in short, basically, um, every team member in your consortia has a role to play. And as long as you can justify their role yes. and you're convinced that they will perform that role, uh, include them. Don't include them just because uh, you, you, you know them or, or, or because you feel that they, they are you know, someone who's, who's very well known, uh, but you're struggling to find their role in that project. Uh, try to avoid those kinds of decisions. Yeah, just to add what uh, Jawad has already mentioned and what... I think is normally multidisciplinary projects are very encouraged nowadays. And there is a domain if the, they find someone from multi domain, and that's very positive for the proposal, uh, the question Saira has asked. So I think the lead uh, person who's the PI, as Jawad has mentioned, has the experience. And if that has the edge, for example, you're doing a, a project in medicine or biology, and that, that involves the technology as well. So that was obviously that sort of consortium is really actually. Uh, uh, that's with the international, you know, even researchers are moving in that direction. So I think that's encouraging. Thanks. Thanks. No, absolutely. I think multidisciplinarity is something that we've discussed at, at length in all our sessions, and that's critical for any project. And, uh, you know, you need to understand which disciplines need to come together uh, for you to be able to ultimately convert that knowledge into impact. And those disciplines must be included. Uh, uh, Ahad, uh, there was another question, I believe, that you had in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, can industry become partner to contribute in implementation product? Yes, Dr. I Kipayat. guess they're asking about industry can, contribution. Can you ask the question again? Sorry, please. Uh, I didn't. The well, question is, and I'll repeat the question, Dr. Kashif. Uh, they're asking if an industry could be a partner uh, in a consortia, uh, in GCF and LCF. Uh, from agency's vantage point, we encourage industry to be a part of these consortia, but uh, it's not a mandatory requirement. There has to be a role they need to be playing. Uh, so, but you may like to add something. Uh, um, uh, Omar, I'm afraid your voice is obviously cutting in the middle. Can you type in here? Then I, I will obviously read in an answer, please. Sorry about that. Ahad, I think my internet reception is acting up. Can you repeat the question for Dr. Kashif? Or type in here, and then that will be easy for me to read. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Kashif, can you hear us? Uh, yes, now clear, yes, now. Uh, okay, Thank the question is, can industry become partners in uh, implementation in implementation product? I guess they're asking if the industry can be a partner in GCF and LCF. Yes, I think that's uh, that, that what's the, uh, look, one thing is that's very important. Sometimes we go to formalities that look, the project is written somewhere like this, so I have to actually like this. You need to assure the success of the project, the idea, the novel, then the methodology and the success. If you, if your partner is actually uh, helping you and they have a track record that they have actually been, my, my domain is cybersecurity, for example. So for, a, for example, I know a company that they have very uh, strong track record of delivering some projects. So that will like, automatically give the evidence that look the success and the, of my project will increase. Now, uh, that's where I've explained the track record is very important. So for, for example, when you're putting the, the partner and the track record is that the company is established in, for example, in 2019, and that's only one year in the market. And that's definitely the reviewer will say, look, you are claiming very high, but the risk is very high. So there's the evidence problem. So I think uh, 
industry is uh, good, but the question is, then we need to make sure putting industry for sake of industry, that does not mean that you will be have a successful project. Putting industry with a good track record will actually ensure your success in the project, not for the proposal acceptance, but also successful delivery of the project. I assume, for example, if maybe your project uh, is successful after finding that you have very good industry and things are done. Funding, ex uh, getting the fund is, is the one goal. But after that, the project is very difficult because if the industry is not participating, then you will have a lot of problems. So I think the track record is really important in the industry and the industry is encouraging us. Thanks. Could I come in at this point, if I may? Yes, sure. Jawad, yes. Jawad. Okay, so look, uh, one I've got a question and I've got a comment. The question is, can industry receive anything as a result of being in the project? I suspect the answer is no, but if it's yes, that's fine. Uh, because sometimes they can act as a consultant as well. And, and again, that increases the chances. Now, in the UK, the first thing that happens when a project like this gets funded, there will be, a, obviously there'll be, a, and I'm sure it's the same here, that there's a, there's a consortium agreement and a collaboration. And, and the consortium agreement, particularly with industry, is usually obviously a, sometimes a separate one because intellectual property, you know, who owns what, who generated what? This is why I keep talking about having not only a risk register, but have a, IP register, which you go over every couple of weeks at least. So, because whoever is generating, let's say uh, Nust University generates the IP, but the partner takes it off, commercializes it, and then says, Thank you very much. You know, or they might do some work. So, it could be joint IP, it could be stolen IP, it could be independent. The company might have depended, done it independently. So, you know, we need to avoid these scenarios because they lead to mistrust. And, 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 uh, and so, having that understanding from day one. What is the agreement on IP, right? Because the, we're developing products or, or solutions. And, you know, I don't know how much steering you're giving on collaboration agreements, particularly with industry. I can point you to some standards that exist. And actually, a lot of it is, uh, if there is a real partnership, then there has to be the possibility that, and in the UK, the default position, by the way, in this type of project would be the university can patent the uh, make the patent filing, particularly if it was developed mainly in the university, and they give a a reasonable term or a license to the company to, to develop it because it's not uh, just about the, uh, the university making lots of money. We don't think like that anymore in the West. We, we, we focus on impact. We say, look, we need the products. We need Pakistani economy to get going. That's we need to create jobs. What we are doing by getting a software on the, on the market, we are creating jobs in industry. Okay. So even if we don't financially benefit directly, Although, you know, there should always be, if there's a sales happening with the product, there should be some small, in the contract you can write that they're based on sales, there should be something back to the university. But again, it's not going to be huge. But, you know, often I think universities, maybe in Pakistan, might be thinking about, oh, we need to make lots of money out of licensing. That's going to, if you try charging stupid amounts of money, you're actually not going to, it's going to kill it. So making sure these are all agreed beforehand is kind of important or certainly before the project starts. So even if you win the project, spend a lot of time and making sure that agreement is absolutely tight. So there's no scenarios where you could end up falling out. You know, it does happen and keep tracking the IP. I think it's a very important point what Jawad mentioned. Jawad is just for the other audience as well. Uh, HEC has very good track record recently than TDF project that, uh, you know, technology transfer projects and they have some success stories, perhaps, uh, you know, the TDF, uh, but again, uh, I'm afraid obviously to let you know that many universities, the IP policy does not exist. So, so that's something what Jawad has mentioned will be very useful to actually consider that because uh, those who are completely new here sitting and listening to us, uh, when you will have successful project, you will come across that actually bottleneck where you will have this sort of problem what Jawad has mentioned, but maybe perhaps TDF team uh, from HEC can actually give, per, you know, share their experiences on the successful grants that they have achieved in the industry. Thank you. I think we are running out of time. Uh, we have a question on the budget, but we have a session, which is a detailed session on the budget, which is on Friday. And I encourage everyone uh, who has questions about the budget, to please join that session and ask those questions in that relevant forum. Uh, 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 perhaps we would like to have concluding remarks from our panelists, uh, starting with Sara uh, Rizvi Jafri. Uh, perhaps on the role of diversity. Uh, uh, that's that's a topic that she covered today. Sarah, if you could please uh, share any concluding remarks uh, for the audience, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Um, I think diversity is really uh, important. And 
I think in most of the eligibility criteria, like at least for NRPU, and I know this for LCF as well, though I haven't applied yet, uh, that they keep asking for um, a multidisciplinary team. Now that could be at sectoral level. So for one of the projects that I worked on, we had the primary healthcare sector with us. We also then had um, individual stakeholders, women development organizations, the rural support uh, program. We had the PPIF with us. So if you see the range, we had somebody from demographics, we had somebody from women's development, we had the actual government sector. And then we had different university collaborators. So from FC College and then Islamabad International University and then uh, LCWU. So this kind of a diversity, and I think this links to what Saira was asking. Uh, do we need to have the uh, PIs to be from the same background? Ideally, no, because uh, whenever I've worked on a project, we've had people from sociology, and, as, and now I'm talking about the PIs, sociology, education, psychology, uh, public health and medical doctors all coming together to work and contribute. And this, um, and because the session was the first part of the session was about mapping your research proposal, that diversity should come through in your research proposal stage as well. How how many different collaborators at our principal investigator stage and at sectoral stage are coming together to strengthen your proposal? And in this way, there would be a greater impact for Pakistan, not just at economic level, but at social cultural level, but and then also at a specific structure like maybe the health sector. And so this diversity is really important. I know everybody's really tired. If there's any other specific question, I hope I answered that, Omar. Yes, you have very well. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you all the esteemed panelists for taking their precious time out today. I would like to make one quick announcement on the last webinar that we are planning on having on the 21st. We plan on having uh, perhaps a showcase uh, uh, for, for those uh, consortia who are looking for partners. They believe uh, uh, there is a gap in their uh, consortia and teams, and they would like to invite uh, uh, potentially international collaborators and researchers to join their team. Uh, Jawadar has, has been very kind to uh, uh, support us in organizing this event. And he has, uh, he also, he wears multiple hats. Uh, one of them is, he's the chair of Upsign, which is a nonprofit uh, platform, uh, which connects international researchers with uh, researchers uh, who, who are looking for teaming up. And, uh, you know, he, he plans on uh, bringing that network uh, to, to uh, hear out from uh, all the, those researchers who are looking to team up uh, and we will give that flow uh, so if you have uh, the need to team up with anyone, uh, I would like you to please reach out to us, write to us at HSC so we can uh, so slot you in for a session, a short presentation on your proposal and uh, what uh, uh, teaming gap that you see where you need a collaborator to come in and help you strengthen your team. And uh, if there's an interest from the network that uh, perhaps Jawad will uh, introduce us to through his Upsign platform, uh, we'll be able to then match make you. Uh, time is short. You need to submit your final proposal on the 4th of October. Uh, so 21st, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, it gives you sufficient time to agree on your teaming arrangements and then work out the documentation that you need to, uh, to submit your final proposal. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for joining our uh, fifth session today uh, and for the wonderful presentations from our esteemed pan panelists that included uh, Dr. Heather, Dr. Kashif, Sa Dr. Sara, and Jawad Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you everyone. Thanks so much as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.